The answer is not going to come from Washington. It's going to come from you. And just like the, the stewardess or the steward now on airplanes, I guess that would be me, put your tray tables in the upright and locked position and prepare. That's what we're going to do, and I'm going to show you exactly what you need to do in the coming weeks and months, and we're going to, quite honestly, I believe people in this audience are going to lead the way to a brighter tomorrow. Now, I want to start in kind of an unusual place, and we will start and end the program here, and believe me, this is worth the ending. I want to show you this building. This is where we start and end. This is the EU Parliamentary Building. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Pretty striking. It's uh, pretty dramatic the way it looks. It's obviously an unfinished building. It is the symbol of one united Europe, one language, one Europe. This is what George Soros calls it. The European Union was built by a process of piecemeal social engineering, as advocated by Karl Popper. Uh, hero. Indeed, it's probably the most successful feat of social en engineering in history. Okay. Popper, if I'm not mistaken, is George Soros' hero. He's a guy that you should look up. Because it's where we're headed. It is the, what did he call it? The greatest feat in social engineering. Now, why are they doing it? Well, let me alert all of the Soros bloggers out there on this one. Yeah, you ready? Here's why they're doing it. Here's why they're pushing uh, everyone into it, because they're building a nouveau volta. And here's why it will fail. You ready? Because what they are aiming for is an affront to God. <gasps> How can Glenn Beck actually say it's an affront to God? I can tell you with 100% total assurity. Why? Because even when it's good intentioned, we know what happens when big government gets control of the people. What? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's the oldest story in the book. I'll show it to you in a minute. History that will boggle your mind. Should you be surprised that the central power has failed to control something? Of course. People are not cats to be rounded up. It's a trend all through history. Do you know, do you know, show that building again. Do you know the idea behind this building? I mean, Europe's not always been one big happy family, but they'll make it one big happy family. The idea was to join together, focus their power centrally, and become a world superpower. Then they abandoned their currencies in favor of one currency, and they officially tied each other together. As nations, you're seeing this in Ireland. They're pressured into doing what's best for the EU first. Worry about your country afterwards. When Greece falls, they fall. Ireland falls, they all fall. It's what we talked about on this program before. Mutually assured economic destruction. You remember this? There's MAD. Add an E in there. Mutually assured economic destruction. You are probably the only audience in America that has even heard of this theory. And it is what's happening to our world. The whole world is being pushed into a, into a global model of government. And George Soros, we've told you, we've shown you the, the strings. The strings that he's pulling are amazing. Is it a coincidence, the EU, and really, I mean, that's... And that's where we're going, and he's a big fan. Really? Global government. That's everybody's answer, it seems, today. Our founders would say smaller government. Everyone who has power now is saying bigger. Tonight, I want to spend some time on global government. One big government. One language. People like George Soros talk about global government like it's a brand new idea. You know, Popper is the guy who's... Oh, he's, he's the guy who's come up with this great idea. Really? No, it's actually one of the oldest ideas known to man. Have you ever heard of the Tower of Babel? Oh, this is fascinating. Buckle up, gang, here we go. It has affected each and every one of our lives and our culture. Without us even really even knowing, your kids start babbling. Comes from this story. 
Did, has anybody ever called, do you remember when we were kids? You're a Nimrod. This story, even Bugs Bunny called Elmer Fudd a Nimrod. Why did he call him a Nimrod? Because he was a hunter. How does Bugs Bunny calling someone a, hunt, a Nimrod because they're a hunter tie in to the Tower of Babel? It's all there, everything. The Bible is not really just a history book. It is really to uh, teach us lessons so we don't forget them. They're the most important lessons in all of man. And you see the pattern. It's always the same pattern. Well, what is the pattern here we're supposed to be looking for? It's in the book of Genesis. After the great flood, everybody on earth was getting together, and then all of a sudden, somebody had a different idea. Hey, how about we all speak one language, and we'll build a tower to reach the sky. Then God wasn't happy about it, and he confused the language, and they all scattered. That's probably your understanding of the Tower of Babel. I've read this story many, many times, but I never really understood it until I talked to a friend of mine. You can read it a million times and never fully understand it unless, unless you have a rabbi, unless you can read it in ancient Hebrew. I can't read Hebrew. I'm guessing you can't either. But we're both in luck because I've got my rabbi. If you have 40 minutes, I promise you this will blow your mind. We have Rabbi Lappin. How are you, sir? Good to see you. Good again. to see you. Um, the rabbi was, when was this, uh, two, three months ago? And you handed me a, uh, a CD that you made, The Tower of Power. Correct. And you live in Seattle, and you came out, and you're on the set, and you said, Glenn, I don't even know why I'm giving this to you. I just felt like I had to give this to you. I started listening to it, and I told you this. Um, I couldn't believe it because I was doing research on ancient Babylon. Oh, my goodness. And all of these things. And, and I look at this, and... It is the answer of many of the things that I was looking for. The Tower of Babel. Let's start up here. This, on this chalkboard here, I've written the things that I remember from the story. Great king says, let's build a tower. Why is that a problem? Who's the king? Why the tower? Well, uh, I mean, the, the important thing is exactly what you said a few moments ago. And that is that we're living now in a, in a time where it's literally the first generation in history where people consider themselves educated and yet are biblically illiterate. Right. I mean, there are pundits well, who, who... Historically illiterate. In every possible way. But right. imagine people who are the heirs of Western civilization not knowing the foundation of Western civilization. People are on television all over the place, probably don't even know how many books in the five books of Moses. <laughs> so I mean, so we, we're talking about a remarkable fact, which people have dismissed the Bible as some uh, obsolete collection of legends about uh, uh, long-forgotten nations. Well, even if it, let, let's just do this. It, let's say, uh, I don't know, Michael Moore is watching. And so let's just say Michael's out there and he's, you know, got Cheetos all over himself and he's like, it's a legend. Let's yeah. just look at the legend itself. That's I don't right. believe it's a legend, but what is it teaching? A great king says, let's build a tower. What's right. wrong with that? Well, a few things are wrong with it. First of all, he didn't actually say, according to chapter 11 in Genesis, and these nine verses really reveal this dark, dark secret that lies at, the, at, the, at the, the deepest recesses of the human soul, which is our susceptibility to become slaves. Uh, it's there, it's, it's ready, it, it can pounce at any moment and transform us into serfs. And, uh, and, and sure enough, these nine verses in chapter 11 of Genesis, as you say, the king Nimrod doesn't say let's build a tower. He starts off with this extraordinary pronouncement, hey everybody, let's build bricks. And then he says, let's build a city and a tower. Now ordinarily people would say, hey, let's build a city and a tower. Shining city on the hill, said John Winthrop. Right. And, um, and people would say, how are you going to do it? Well, we'll make bricks. No. Here, the key thing was, let's make bricks. And what's more, he's not identified necessarily or early as a king. He's first of all identified as a hunter back in chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. Now, here's the key thing about that, Glenn. Um, everybody was hunting. Right. Today, it's just the good guys hunt. But back then, everybody hunted. That's how you ate. Why on earth would this one man, Nimrod, be identified as a hunter? Because he hunted not animals, he hunted people. Not to kill them. He hunted people to seduce them into becoming his subjects and to allow him to become their master. Okay. So he said, um, Nimrod, 
a great hunter of man, um, he says, let's build bricks, and then let's build a city. Why did he say, let's build bricks first? What do the bricks represent? Okay, bricks are, are really important things here. And later on in the five books of Moses, uh, ancient Jewish wisdom highlights the fact that an altar, an altar to God, must not be built of bricks, right? It has to be built with stone. Why? Because this tension between bricks and stones is absolutely crucial. Bricks and stones are a biblical metaphor for the way people should be stones and the way we are easily pulled to becoming I live in, bricks. I live in Connecticut. Stone walls are so beautiful because yes. th everything is different and it takes a real artist exactly. to be able to put them all together. That's so you're saying that the, the stones are representative people, right? Two and differences all different. between bricks and stones. Number one, every brick is the same as every other brick. That's the whole point. They're totally interchangeable. Right. If you want to turn people into bricks, you are able to turn them into interchangeable socioeconomic cogs that can just be plugged around society. The second thing about bricks is they're made by man. Stones are each and utterly unique. So when we have as a tradition in Western civilization that man is created in the image of God, what it really means is that just as God is unique, so is every single human being unique, just like a stone. Don't allow other people to turn you into bricks. Retain the personality it's and the, the purpose between, for which you were created. It's the difference between yes, I can, and yes, we can. Yes, exactly. Right, okay. So, um, so Nimrod is a guy, and, and um, he says, uh, we want to, I'm, I'm going to build, I'm going to build bricks. Was it, uh, was it a real religious society? Because this is right after the Great Flood. Everybody's w wiped off, and um, everybody's scattered their own way. They all have their own language, right? Many different languages. And they're all, and they're all worshiping God. Yes. And Nimrod comes, and it, he, is there something about, you know, he had, a, uh, he had a new idea, right? Tell me about the new idea. The new idea is, uh, and it's presented as, as the, the Babel blueprint. This is not a, a long-forgotten story. This is actually something which is as relevant today as it will be tomorrow, as it was when Robespierre was conducting the French Revolution. The principle is always the same. The two competing ways of organizing human society. One is the Abraham vision of individual independence, uh, ind individual accountability, God-centric mm -hmm. versus the idea of centralized control. And it can be really, um, I mean, even our founders, both Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson, were misled by Robespierre. They thought the French Revolution was good. It's a very subtle difference if you don't know what you're looking for, right? Very important right. difference, exactly right. And Thomas so, Paine ended up in prison. In, so, right. so Abraham gives the vision of individual uh, independence, which always has to include economic independence. That's absolutely crucial. And sure enough, Abraham, first man in the Bible described as a wealthy man. A blessing, a good thing, not a curse. Okay. It's a good thing. All right. So when we come back, um, the bricks and the mortar... And when, uh, America, when you find out um, what the mortar means um, in Hebrew, right? Yes. Yeah, what the mortar, what that translation, mortar is not mortar. Bricks are not bricks in this story. When you see it, and you begin to see the parallels of what is happening today. Remember, this is a story to remind us what not to do. And then God gets mad and punishes them. No. No, he doesn't. Wait until you hear the rest of this story. Back in just a second.